In this lesson, we're going to introduce you to a really new, fascinating part of C++. Up to this point, all you could declare in a program were the basic built-in primitive C++ types. Shorts and ints and bools and strings and characters. And there's not a whole lot that you can do with those individually. Suppose that you want to write a program to take care of the inventory of a business. Well, you can't hardly do that with ints and strings and characters unless you were able to combine them into structures, bags of variables that you could carry around. And that's exactly what a struct is. So a struct is your introduction to object-oriented programming. We'll get into a lot more details when we look at classes, but this is just an introduction. It allows you to declare an abstract kind of object, and, and so we call them objects instead of variables. So you can build programs to better simulate the real world. You can make types for tables and chairs and buildings and students and trees and whatever you want. So you're going to take disparate types and bundle them together into one type that you name yourself. So let's take a look at the syntax. For a struct, it's going to be the keyword struct, your type name, and then member variables. So in this case, in our example, you're going to place this in its own header file called, say, point.h. The keyword struct uh, indicates to the compiler that this is a type that you are inventing. You're going to name it point, that's the type name, and then your member variables will be, well, the first one is member variable of type float, and its name is m underscore x coordinate. Now, I prefer to use the m underscore as a prefix to the names of variables that are members of structs and classes. Classes will come later. That way, when you see that variable name in the future in the program, you know that it's a member variable of some user-defined type. So in this case, we have two floats, m underscore x, m underscore y. And the last point I want to make is don't forget that semicolon. The semicolon at the end of the definition is extremely important. If you forget it, you'll generate, I don't know how many errors, dozens upon dozens. I counted once at 73, but that was several years ago. I don't know what it'll give you now. Don't forget that semicolon after the definition of a struct or a class. So let's take a look. You see what our definition for point is. It's two floats, one for the x value, one for the y value. Now suppose that I declare a point. Well, the declaration is just like any other declaration, just like you're declaring an int or a character or a bool or anything. It's always type and name. Type and name. So P1 and P2 are of type point. Each one of those objects contains two floats. So one float is what? It's four bytes. If there's two floats, there's eight bytes in each. There's 16 bytes of memory declared in this line of code. So each one of these guys, P1 and P2, have an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. Now how do I access the member variables of an object of type struct? You use a new kind of operator. It's called the dot operator. And there it is, okay? Make sure you see it. I've got an extra big arrow to make sure that you understand that it is a dot. There it is. And just to emphasize, that is the operator, the dot operator. So to assign to the x coordinate of P1, I have to write then P1 dot M underscore x coordinate and then the usual assignment. I want to make something very clear to you. What is this? It is a point. It's a point object. But what is this? It is a float. And you can treat it just like you treat any float in any other instance. So if I want to read into the y coordinate, value 6, there it is. If I want to write it out, then I can write it out as such. That's just a float. Structs within structs. Well, of course, you can use the type. Once you've defined a type, say point here, you can use that 
in another type. So I can declare line as a type. So it follows the syntax, struct, line, open and close curly braces, don't forget the semicolon, and then it has member variables of type point. So again, it's type and name. I named this one the left point of the line and this guy the right point of the line. That begs the question, how do we access the member variables of the line? Again, remember that this is a line, this is a point, and this is a float. So I can assign, as usual, with an assignment variable, 8 to that value. My line is of type line. Each line has two points, a left point and a right point. Each point has two coordinates, an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. And so if I'm going to assign to a line's left endpoint x-coordinate, the value 5, that means 5 is going into that float position. And likewise with the value 8. As another example, again, you have to imagine much larger programs. Suppose that you're going to work for a auto supply company and you're going to run a database for them. Each car part has many pieces of information associated with it a description of what it is, a part number, a wholesale price, a retail price, a color, a manufacturer, a uh, date received, quantity in stock, etc. Rather than declaring all of these variables separate for 10,000 different parts, you can declare then a type, a new type in C++ called car part. And you do that with a struct definition and then you can use the various parts of that struct to define or describe an individual object. You know, remember the definitions, this is what I call the definition of a new type, you want to put that in its own header file. I say its own header file because that way you can carry it from one project to another. Now, for the purposes of learning and say this class, uh, with a struct, it's reasonable to simply put that definition in a header for the entire programming project. Unless, of course, you have many different struct types. Then it might be wise to keep them separate. What's a forward declaration? Well, let's take a look at this situation. If you were to write the definition of a line and it contains a point, then when the compiler gets to that point in the compilation, it's not going to know what a point is. You have the definition of point below it. It hasn't seen that definition before. Now, of course, one solution to this problem is swap them. Put the definition of point before the definition of line. But if for some reason that's difficult or you didn't think of it or whatever the reason, what you can create here is what's called a forward declaration. This right here, struct point semicolon. What you're telling the compiler is that this new type exists. It's going to be defined eventually. Don't worry about it. Just recognize that when you see the identifier point, it is going to be defined. That way the compiler, when it sees point here in the definition of line, it's happy. It knows that eventually the definition of point will come forward. Okay, here are some tips. Several years ago, I gave an assignment to some students and told them they needed to create a complex number struct. And uh, then in their program, they were to read in the name of the user of the program and use their name in subsequent prompts and output. And there were several students who made the mistake of putting the name inside the definition of the struct. That doesn't make any sense because Complex numbers don't have names. And another mistake, they forgot that semicolon. So don't forget that semicolon. And only put in a definition of a struct what is pertinent. There are no names for complex numbers. They have only a real part 
and an imaginary part, and that's it. Even the I, when you write Z is equal to A plus BI, the I is simply a formatting element. The A is the real part, B is the imaginary part, and that's all that should be in the definition of that complex number. That uh, is the end of this lesson. And I wanted to introduce you to the fellow that's been helping me with the sound effects in this lesson. You all know him, I'm sure.